We're going to take a look at uh, piston installation today on a 440 Chrysler engine. This engine in particular has been bored 30 thou over and it's really important when you're installing a brand new set of rings on any engine to make sure that the piston fits correctly, number one, with the right clearance and number two, that the rings fit to the cylinder with the correct ring end gap. Piston rings in engines, there's, there's a common myth um, and there's some understanding with it too that piston rings rotate continuously in the bore. If they were to continuously rotate in the bore, then eventually the ring end gaps would all line up and we would have a lack of compression pressure and the ability to actually seal the rings to the cylinder walls and then we would have hard starting and maybe even increased engine blow by in that particular cylinder or maybe even all cylinders. So the rings do tend to walk around a little bit during the first break-in period on a brand new installation. They might even do half a lap. They don't do laps and laps and laps, but what ends up, what ends up happening is they eventually find a spot where they're comfortable through what's called the break-in period based on friction and pressure in the cylinder, and then that holds the ring in that position, and typically it stays in that position for the rest of the engine's life. Um, if they were to continually rotate, then they would wear the rings out really prematurely. So again, making sure that the piston fits correctly, the rings fit correctly, is an important attribute to any good engine build. So we're going to take a look at how we go about uh, installing the rings in the cylinders, measuring them, installing them on the piston, and then doing the actual piston fit into the cylinder. So first thing I want to talk about is the ring configurations. So the circumferential oil control assembly is a three-piece assembly that we put together on the piston and it consists of two scraper rings and then one stainless steel backup ring or a tension ring. Uh, when this is put together all as one assembly, so the three pieces, it's called the circumferential because it goes around the circumference of the piston. These angles that are on here, some are spiral wound. This one is cut, it almost looks like a digital sine wave. And it really is a way of holding engine oil in all these little voids. When we hold the engine oil in there, then it can be controlled by going on and off of the cylinder wall by the movement of the scraper rings on the assembly as the piston is moving throughout its stroke from top dead center to bottom dead center. So piston rings, they, they do a lot of work for us in the cylinder. One, they're a dynamic seal, which means they're in movement to control the sealing effect of compression pressure in the engine. We need to maintain compression pressure for two things really. One, for combustion, so that the pressure is high enough for combustion. And two, that pressure that's attained in the cylinder actually pushes the ring out to the cylinder wall and maintains a seal. So as piston rings wear and become worn in the cylinder, it takes more pressure to push them out on the cylinder wall which now drops the cylinder pressure, which takes away from the available pressure that we would typically need for the combustion process. So most piston ring assemblies on four-stroke cycle engines are made up of a three-ring configuration. They may not be of a three-ring circumferential oil control ring assembly for the oil control ring. It might be a one-piece. Um, some engines are like that, a lot of OEM. This is a kind of a custom engine application. It's an overbore, it's got billet aluminum pistons in it, so um, it just happens to be the type of piston ring that I fit for this particular engine application. The two other rings, which are the compression ring, the top compression ring, and it has a chromium face on it. They are cast rings which are very, very hard. They are very brittle, so we don't spiral these rings on. If rings are spiraled, installed, then it can distort them. When we look at the scraper rings, they're very malleable, they're very uh, flexible, and it's okay, and in, in the instructions on this particular ring set and others that I've done, 
it shows that the ring assembly can be spiral installed. This one is not going to distort its face as much as a hard cast ring that when it's spiraled, it will actually distort the face of the ring and then it won't fit properly in the piston ring groove and it won't move properly when it's going up and down in the cylinder. So again, like I'd mentioned, the rings are a dynamic sealing ring, so they function typically in movement. So the ring as it's moving up and down in the cylinder tends to move in the piston ring groove. And that's why it's important to make sure we have the right side clearance in the ring so that the ring can move and that we have the right end gap in the ring so that if it's too big, we lose pressure to push it out against the cylinder wall. If it's too small, we can actually cause binding when the engine changes temperature. That's another factor that uh, is the reason why we use piston rings in an engine is one to control the amount of heat in this cylinder which takes the transfer of the heat from the piston through the piston ring groove to the ring to the cylinder wall through the oil that's on the cylinder wall. So again having the right oil scraper configuration is going to control the amount of oil in the cylinder so it reduces engine oil consumption as well as providing the right amount of lubrication on and off of the cylinder wall to provide friction reduction and heat transfer during operation of the piston in the cylinder. So what I'm going to do here uh, first of all is we're going to take a look at these rings and I have these rings marked and they have a small dot on the ring and that dot will uh, allocate the position. When there is two dots, uh, one on each ring, it just means that both rings are to be facing up. The manufacturer of this ring set informs me that the chromium faced ring is the top compression ring and it has a barrel face on the inside. It's kind of hard to see on the camera. Um, and then the second ring is a straight cut or a back cut ring configuration and it's very easy to see uh, visually but a little harder to see on the camera. So a lot of times manufacturers, if the rings are of the exact same configuration, same dimension, same profile of ring, straight cut or barrel faced or reverse cut, doesn't tapered, doesn't really matter what configuration that they are, but if they are both exactly the same, they're both exactly the same dimension, then the manufacturer will put one dot for the top or they might put a mark on it saying top and then the second ring will have two dots on it to allocate the second ring. So there is no miscommunication of installation for that particular ring set. So this manufacturer informs me that the chromium face one goes on the top and that the cast scraper goes on, the, on as the second one. So I'm going to go ahead and install this into the cylinder. The cylinder is lightly lubricated and I'm just going to push this in just with my fingers. So I have a piston here that we're going to be using to install all the rings on and I'm going to use this as my tool to position the ring squarely in the bore so that I can measure the piston ring end gap. So I take the piston and typically what we want to do is we want to go about halfway down in the cylinder or at half stroke which is going to be indicative of what's called the compression height of the piston. The compression height of the piston goes from the center line of the pin to the furthest most point of the manufactured design of the piston at the top. So I'm just going to go just slightly past the pin so I get myself about halfway down in the bore. So I'm just taking the piston, lining it up, and then pushing it down to where I'd like to see it. And then I can take my feeler gauges and then go in and measure the cylinder to find out, or pardon me, measure the ring to find out how much ring end gap I have to make sure that it falls within manufacturer spec. So after measuring now the piston ring end gap and I've attained all the measurements that I need, typically you go by manufacturer's recommendations on the end gap on the rings and you check every single ring to make sure that there isn't going to be any binding on any of the ring assemblies when you install them on the piston. The manufacturer will give you the spec 
if you don't have a spec, you can typically go by the actual bore dimension, and for every one inch of bore, you're going to use three thou of ring end gap. So for an example, if you had a five inch bore, then you would need at least a minimum of 15 thou for the piston ring end gap to ensure that it doesn't bind during operation. Now the rings are also meant to control expansion and contraction ratios in the engine. Cold engine starting in the morning, hot engine starting on a hot day, hot engine starting after running for a long period of time under extreme load or under normal operating conditions. So let's take a look at the installation of the piston rings and then the fit to the cylinder. I mentioned already that this particular engine has been bored 30 thou over and it's marked right on the piston, one, the orientation of the piston, which direction it goes in the engine, and two, the actual size bore difference that this is going to fit into the engine block. So I'm going to mount this up into what we call a rod clamp and it goes on the beam of the connecting rod and that allows me to have both hands to work around the piston to do the install and then to set the piston ring end gap and to put on the ring compressor to get it ready for the installation. Continuing with the ring install, so I'm going to take the very first ring and because it's a very pliable ring, I can spiral it into the groove. So I'm going to put it into this groove and then I'm going to actually take it back out of the groove and put it on the back side of the piston simply for the fact that I need to put it onto the step that's on the stainless steel ring that I'm going to be installing here in a moment. So be careful when you're doing this not to scratch the piston, position it, and you can see it takes a little bit of a, an effort to get it in a position that is not intrusive to the next step. So now as in prior instruction here we talked about this uh, backup ring which is a stainless steel ring that has steps on it. So now I'm going to install this and because it's very pliable again I can just do it by hand. So it has an end gap and I'm not going to worry about it right at the moment but I'm just going to move it out of the way and now I'm going to put my first bottom scraper ring onto it and then just follow it around and it drops right in and onto the step. So I'm going to hold the backup ring and I'm going to just slide the actual scraper ring. So I know that I'm sitting on that step that I showed you earlier in the video. So now I'm going to take the next ring and these rings don't have any orientation marks on them. Anytime there is an orientation mark, the manufacturer will give it to you in the instructions in the ring box or they will mark it right on the ring. So it's good to make sure that you make some observations prior to installation. So again, the next one, and I'm just going to spiral this one. And like I said, we don't normally spiral, spiral rings, but these ones, because they're very soft and pliable, they can be done by hand, and it doesn't take much effort to actually put them in like this, and it's very easy to do that way. So the next step, I'm going to go on to the, the next position and get myself right on to that backup ring which is part of that circumferential oil control ring assembly. So again I'm going to hold this and then I'm just going to take the gap and I'm going to move the ring make sure that it doesn't bind. I've checked it in the bore and I'm good to go for that one until we do the ring end gap prior to the installation. So now the next ring that I'm going to use and as per instruction of the manufacturer they want the cast ring as the second and they want the one with the chromium face on it as the first ring. So you can see I still have my orientation marks on there so I, I make sure that I can see them. And then I'm going to use a set of ring expanding pliers. There's a bunch of different ones that actually hold the whole ring. I've chose these ones. A lot of guys will put these on by hand just for the feel. If you're doing it by hand you could overstretch the ring and you could twist the ring. So the best thing to do is to use a plier that opens it up to meet the gap that you need it to to get it over top of the ring. So I'm just going to open it just enough to get it over the ring, push it into the groove on the opposite end to the gap, and then let the ring go and feel the fit. And you can see this ring moves nice and easily on the piston. It looks bigger than it is, but don't forget it's going to be compressed down to meet the gap that we already established in the bore and then that will give us our running clearance for piston ring end gap. 
So now we're going to take the next ring, the very top ring, and I'm going to do the exact same thing with our piston ring expanding pliers. And I'm going to open it just enough to get over the top of the piston. And I'm going to drop it in opposite to the gap. And there it drops right into its bore. And it's a good idea to grab a hold of these and rotate them. And you'll see me do this also when we do the oil because I want to make sure when I put the oil on that it's completely lubricated. So we've installed the rings on the piston. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take a pick and I'm going to find my end gap to the uh, stainless steel backer. And I'm just going to position it roughly where I want to see it right now. So the piston is going in in this direction forward. And because it's a V configurated engine, we don't want the gap lying on the bottom side of the V because that's where oil could potentially pool. And that's where it's going to cause uh, flooding of the oil control ring. And then it's going to be hard for the ring to compensate. The oil control ring is meant to regulate and compensate for the amount of oil needed, but it has a hard time controlling it if it's flooded. If it's flooded, carbon builds there and then the ring sticks and then the ring doesn't function correctly. So what I'm going to do is because the piston is going to be in this direction, I should have this gap facing up. So I'm going to put it roughly to the center of the piston on the upside. Then I'm just going to find the end gaps, which I can feel. I'm going to hold the backup ring and I'm just going to rotate the scrapers. Now I'm bringing the scrapers up just past the piston pin. It's a common trade practice not to line up the end gaps with the pin because really the pressure and the oil can squeeze by, go through the pin and then leak down the other side. So it's not a common practice to do that. Some information will tell you that it doesn't really matter where you put the ring end gaps, but if there's literature from a manufacturer saying that they're supposed to be in these positions, it's based on research and development and they've proved through use of their components that that's where that ring should be. If it didn't matter and the rings did lapse, like I explained earlier, then you could just put them in anywhere you wanted to. So we need to have some continuity with where we're installing them because it does definitely help maintain proper quality of oil between the cylinder walls and of course regulating it. Now the top ring acts as a compression ring and we typically call this a fire ring. The second ring acts as a backup ring to the fire ring to assist in compression to seal the cylinder and the rings to the cylinder wall. And it also works in combination capacity to help scrape a little bit of oil away from the scraper assembly. So the oil scraper assembly is the one that's actually required to do most of the work for controlling the quality of oil, the quantity of oil, and controlling how it brings it on and off based on the sharpness of that particular ring. So I'm going to take some engine oil and I've, I've use this one in particular because it's a little bit of a different grade. It tends to be a little thicker. Um, I'm going to be using a mineral base or a standard type of oil in the bottom end of the engine. This is a 530 SAE motor oil that uh, tends to be a little bit thicker and it just helps lubricate the rings. So simply I've just put a hole in here and a lot of guys install pistons with very little lubrication and I'm going to do what's called flooding the rings and you can see that when I lift up on these rings that and I'm going to turn them I'm making sure don't be I'm making sure that they've got lots of oil in behind them and in the grooves and that they still turn freely okay don't be afraid to flood the rings with oil prior to the installation when guys install engines I've seen in the past a lot of times they don't bother putting enough oil on it and you know what the scraper ring is going to control what it really needs at that point so during the first assembly if you got to make a mess you got to make a mess but it's for the purpose of installing the rings so I'm going to take our piston ring compressor and because my hands are nice and wet with engine oil now 
I'm going to put this on, but first thing I'm going to do is basically I'm going to take a look at, again, the position of this piston. And it's going to sit forward in the engine like this. So I am going to make sure that I have my scraper assembly. I can see the gap. I'm turning the oil control ring assembly. I can see one scraper gap here. There's another scraper gap on the opposite side. And I have the center or the end of that stainless backer right in the middle, which will be at the top when the piston is installed because it's forward this direction. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the top ring and I'm going to put it close to the top and then I'm going to bring it about 120 degrees apart so I'm slightly past the pin. And again, like I said, I don't want the gap lined up with the pin because the pressure can go right down through here, through this side and back to the sump, reducing the amount of pressure. I want to maximize it. And again, if these rings want to vibrate around and find their home, they'll find their home but hopefully they're not going to be doing laps. So I'm going to take my piston ring compressor and I'm going to back this thing off so that I can get it over top. And it's a little bit of a fiddly event here to do this, but it's the process. So now that I've got it over top and then I'm going to just line it up with the top flange of the piston and close it up. Now I want to make sure I can turn the rings, which means I haven't bound the rings. I'm going to make sure that I'm not in the end gap area and I'm not because we don't want to have the end gap at the gap on the piston ring compressor because when we go to install it we can actually cause the ring to bend and flex and we won't know that until the engine runs and we have a potential failure. So it's it's still moving. I'm going to back it off again just a little bit more and tighten it up because I want to have a little tighter fit during the installation. And again, if you cannot move a piston ring installer while it's installed on the piston, then you have it way too tight and you're going to be hammering the piston way too hard to install it. So I like the feel of that. I've got my gap set. So we'll move on to the next step, installing the bearing and installing the covers for the hardware prior to installation in the cylinder. Now that I have the piston rings installed on the piston and it's ready to go in the bore, now I'm just going to move it over to the bench to do some more installation work. Okay, so now continuing on with the install, I've got my piston rings on and clamped and ready to go into the bore. Now I want to install the bearing and protect the crankshaft from these sharp threads that are on the fasteners. So this particular manufacturer uses a uh, sliding fit cap, which the cap fits together. It can possibly move around a little bit, but the, uh, the fasteners are stepped to help control the cap when it's on place so that it doesn't move around. You can see the end of this cap's been ground and that was for the balancing process to balance these lighter rods to the steel crank based on the weight of the piston. So now the reciprocating mass weight equals the offset weight of the counter shaft or the, count, the counter weights on the crankshaft. So this particular engine bearing is a 10 thou underbearing because the crankshaft has been ground under size which means now we need to have a larger bearing that has 10 thou more material to it. This is where a lot of technicians get confused with undersize and oversize. Yes, the bearing technically is larger than, so it is oversize, but how manufacturers and machine shops rate it, it is based on the size of the crankshaft. So if the crankshaft has been ground under its size by whatever particular value, then we use an undersized bearing to fit to it. So this crankshaft has been ground to 10 thou undersize. And on the back of the bearing, it will tell you the size of it. And right beside the size, for, its, for example, it says 0 0.010 US. So it's an undersized bearing. Doesn't mean that it's United States, it means that it's undersized bearing. So the lock tang on the bearing is really only for the purpose of installation. 
it does not hold that bearing in place. A lot of people tend to think that if the lock is good, then it's going to hold it in place. All it's meant for is for the technician to be able to orient the bearing in its correct position. And what actually holds the bearing in place is the crush that sticks up above the parting line. And when it's all torqued in place, the amount of pressure that is put on it with the torque on the cap forces the bearing into the radii, so half of that diameter, and it holds it in its position. When we don't have enough crush, then it can cause the bearing to actually move or spin. And that's where we end up with a spun bearing in the bottom end. Now, bearings can spin for other reasons, lack of lubrication, and no matter what, if the crank tags this thing, it's going round. So, the other thing is a lot of technicians worry about is the fact that should I or shouldn't I touch the bearing? Well, if your hands are clean, you can see my hands are clean, it's okay to touch the bearings. I have a little bit of oily residue on my hands from working around the engine, that's okay. But if you just take your clean, dry hands and touch the bearings, it will actually cause acids to come from the oils on your skin and then create an etched form on the bearing. And if you pour oil on it, it literally goes around your fingerprint. So that can cause localized hot spotting and then a premature failure during that installation. So don't feel afraid to touch the bearings while you're installing them. So when you install it, and this one here, all I'm gonna do, and I'll show you in a moment here on the cap, is I'm gonna use the tang to align it, and then I'm gonna push it in position, and I'm gonna do what's called centering the crush. And I wanna feel that I've got a little bit on both sides, which means it's protruded so that when the cap goes on, it pushes it down into position and holds it there during installation. So now in that case, I've got this done. I'm just gonna take some white lube and I'm gonna put some white lube on the face of the bearing, on the side of the bearing because this is what's called a mated rod configuration, which means two rods run right beside each other. I'm gonna make sure I don't have it on the parting surface simply because I don't want anything to interfere with the cap fitting in its position. So I'm going to install the bearing now, and again, like I had mentioned, I'm going to put the lock in position, and I'm going to use my thumbs to position the bearing on the parting line. And I want to have some crush here sticking up. Like I had mentioned before, when this gets clamped down on the connecting rod, then it's going to provide equal radial pressure to push this in position. Again, I'm using the lock to position it. The lock does not hold it. So because we're going to plastic gauge this, I'm not gonna put grease on it right at the moment. I'm just gonna put a little bit of engine oil on it and I'm gonna run my finger on there and make sure I've got lots of engine oil on there. Next thing I'm gonna do is take the little bit of oil that I have on my fingers and because I have dry fasteners here is I'm just going to put a little bit of lube on these threads to make sure that I'm not binding when I install these. So now that I've got the piston and the cap all ready to go in, I wanna make sure that I protect the crankshaft from the threads on these fasteners. So I'm just gonna use these little Clevite engine bearing um, caps that they're provided by this company. And we just squeeze them, put them over top, make sure that it's not interruptive to the movement of the connecting rod going into the bore and down over the crank pin. So again, if we nick the crankshaft, it can take the bearing out very quickly. So we're going to continue on with the install of the piston now.